Welcome to our sunrise safari. We are coming to you live on this cloudy morning where in fact a sunrise might not be a distinct possibility, although it will eventually at some point get lighter. We're coming to you live from Juma and Arethusa game reserves in the Sabi sands of South Africa. Excuse the distraction. I'm looking for lion tracks. So Kevin and Michelle and Lucy, who is always on the ball, picked up on the calls of the lions last night. Now Brent is also following up. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Thought I saw tracks. That's a termite mound. Behind the termite mound is a lion. Is two lions. Is three lions. Is four lions. Good morning, ladies. <laughs> oh, that was a nice surprise. I better just let Brent know. Doesn't often happen to me that Brent and I go searching for a lion pride and we both happen to encounter them. But let me just let him know and then we'll go a little bit, shuffle a little bit closer and have a squiz or twos here. How very convenient. I hadn't even finished saying an introduction to you all. So good morning, my name is Jamie. I have Viam on camera with me this morning. And don't forget that we're interactive so you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Let's actually go a little bit so that I can pop the spotlight down. Hello, ladies. That was terribly, terribly convenient of you. Some start. So these were the ladies that you all were, we all heard shouting at some, t some point last night. Four Nkuhuma lionesses, the fifth is mating with a Birmingham boy on Torchwood. There's one eye half open. And very sleepy lionesses. Now, let's try and have a look at those bellies. Do they look full? Because yesterday when we saw them on the sunrise safari, they were looking distinctly hungry. Ah, oh, I can hear a ground hornbill as well. Cook, 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 cook. That lioness at the back, no, these lions have not eaten. So they've spent the whole night searching for the possibility of a kill and a meal. Obviously not being successful. That's not uncommon with lions since about, oh, sorry, move my head out of the way, about one in every 12 kills is successful. So a slightly less than a, oh sorry, 12% success rate in terms of kills. So attempted kills, attempted started kills, compared to what they actually successfully managed to capture is quite a large success margin, which means they put in a hell of a lot of effort in order to catch their food. But last night was cloudy, it was windy. I'm quite surprised they didn't manage to take advantage of it. But that bodes well for us this morning because it means that although they are resting now, there's a very good chance that they're going to be up and walking at some point soon. Right, I'm going to get hold of Brent. Stations for Mufazi Ngala, just to the south of quarantine, along towards Philemon's Dip. There are Lalapanzi on the western side of the road. Probably well then, Jamil. I think I'm going to head down to the east end. There's a single elephant pool at Juma Van. Copy that. There's also ground hornbill calling around the Bry site on quarantine. Very well rested lions. I 
wondered, you know, we drove along quarantine and I looked at the herd of impala and I thought they looked a little bit unsettled and a bit skittish. And now we have a very clear reason why. Quarantine, for newer viewers, is a large open clearing that falls basically within the heart of the Inkahuma's home range. I know that James did a very descriptive drawing of the territories of the various lions. Hmm, I wonder what's on the back of her neck there. Could just be dirt. Could also be a tick, very large tick. If we're really lucky, since they have been vocal, they might just stand up and call or lie down and call. They don't seem to bother too much about being up. <laughs> Maggie's saying, oh, Don, wake up and rise and shine, ladies. It's time to be up and about, switch on the lights. I'm trying to keep the lights out of their straight in their faces. They don't seem terribly bothered. Fast asleep. Maggie, I think they are going to get up. That would be my prediction. And as soon as one does, then we'll be able to judge just how full their stomachs are. These lionesses, to me, look a little bit like, well, they look a bit fuller, if you can describe it as that, than the other two. And I don't think that's because they've had a meal. I think they were just better fed before. And as I said, they might get up and start to call, particularly with a fifth member absent from this particular group. They might contact call across towards Torchwood to her. I wonder which lioness is missing. I didn't get a chance yesterday to have a really good look at which one it might be. I almost want to guess Amber Eyes, since she's been coming and going with this particular pride. Oh, apparently James identified Amber Eyes yesterday morning. So not Amber Eyes, as I guessed. Well, we'll just have to wait and see when they start to wake up. Very soon it's going to be the sub-adult's turn to start mating with the Birmingham boys. She will, she's reaching that right age, and I think that's why they've now completely relaxed with her presence. Hard to believe, actually, that it's the same lioness that we were watching all those months ago. She has grown so much. I reckon she is, what do we say, she's probably about two and a half now. So by three years old, she will be mating with the, with the Birminghams and producing her first offspring. Luckily for her, though, unlike a leopard or a cheetah, first-time moms have to learn how to do it all by themselves. She's got the protection of her mom and her aunts and her sisters to keep her company and to teach her exactly how to go about being a mom. That being said, of course, she'll probably head off and disappear into some thick bush for a while, all on her own. Now, unlike the Styx lionesses, the Inkahumas are not pregnant that we can see. That doesn't mean they're not. It means if they are, they are very early stages of pregnancy. There's no swollen nipples. And those of you who have screenshots from the Styx lionesses and the Inkahuma stomachs, you can really get an idea. You can compare the nipples of those lionesses and the shapes of their bellies. Even though the sticks were quite full when we saw them, you can really see how they're carrying the weight towards the back, towards the back legs. Whereas with these lionesses, there's no sign of any nipple swelling. I don't think that they are, if they are pregnant, it is not early stage, um, or it is early stage, it's not late stage. It'll be a while before we expect cubs from the Nkuhuma ladies. There you can see, if we have a look at the belly of the lioness at the back, oopsie, sorry. Now, on the Styx female, just where that grass is touching her belly, you very clearly have seen nipples. Sorry, girl. I know that was a rather um, intense explanation. Oh, heads, heads sort of up. Stretch. Mm, nope. Back to sleep again.
and Ravi watching in New York City. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari, Ravi. Ravi's been reading up on lions and lion numbers and has read that since the 1950s, the lion population has been reduced by roughly 50% and would like to know what sort of things I feel have contributed to that decline in lion numbers. The first thing I'm going to say, Ravi, is that that applies across sort of, so for lions as a species throughout Africa. Within South Africa, the lion population has actually, it's almost considered to be an overpopulation in certain areas. That's unique to within South Africa, and it's probably you'll find because South Africa as a history has had a more stable background than some of the other African countries. In terms of what's contributed to the lion decline, the biggest reason for it is civil war. Civil war and un unrest and poverty within the African countries in which lions also roam freely has resulted in not the death of the lions, strangely enough. The lion poaching, whilst a problem, is not the largest cause of their loss. It's actually poaching of bushmeat. So catching various antelope species, going through and essentially ravaging the prey species of the lions. And that's what's resulted in their decline in numbers. They've run out of food throughout Africa. That combined with habitat loss, the loss of their natural movement, their ability to move between places, has resulted in the decline in the lion population. They are fairly, as a population within South Africa, a fairly stable species compared to some of the others. Now, there's a very similar situation in terms of numbers within South Africa versus the rest of Africa, and that applies to the African elephant. And apparently, Brent would like to say good morning and has also found one for you. Morning, morning, morning. Uh, here we have a very interesting chap. Uh, some of you might recognize him as the elephant bull who likes to come say hello to cars, most recently to Scott. And there was a lot of debate whether he might be about to come into must, and he probably was, because he's at the moment in full must. You can see extremely wet around the back legs and also around the face, the preorbital glands. I mean, you see, as he turns, you can see that big hole. Now, he's obviously developed a little bit of a habit with messing with cars, so I'm going to move off. I don't let elephants play. Hey! Don't you start nonsense with me. OK, so what happened there is I had to bang the car, because otherwise he probably would have done the same thing as he did with Tara and Scott. And we don't want him to get into that habit. So I started trying to move away, and he started moving closer towards us. That's why I banged the car. Uh-uh. Yeah, now you're looking sheepish. I'm going to start the car again now. And I'm going to try and move off slowly, but if he does come at us again, I will bang the side of the car. Yes, you're very big. Hey! There we go. So it's very important to read elephant behavior like that. And now he'll think twice before playing with a car again. So a lot of those situations that people get into that become dangerous can be avoided by understanding elephants. He is, silly boy. Now, it's very important for us not to flee off now. That would just cause him to run after the car. So we're almost in a bit of a Mexican standoff situation, yeah? <laughs> yes, yes. You're very pretty. He's going to shake his head. All right, we've enough of this now. Stop it. So, as I said, very important for us not to rush off. But again, we mustn't let him get too close. There we go. He's going to go on his way, and I'm going to go on my way. And uh, we'll call that a draw. But uh, it's just really important. You can avoid those situations uh, just by really having spent a lot of time with elephants. There we go. Bye-bye, big boy. We'll have one last look of him as he disappears across towards quarantine. And... I'm just going to let 
uh, ask final control just to let everyone know, uh, particularly some of our tech staff who are going to be driving to and from our two camps, uh, to just be a little bit cautious and if they see that elephant today, to avoid him because he is in must. And I'm quite convinced he might have done the same thing he's done before if we hadn't stopped him. And now, hopefully, we've taught him a little lesson and he might not be as eager to sort of approach the cars and touch the cars again. Now, I know there's a lot of videos and stuff out on the internet and certain reserves and very close to here who let elephants touch their trackers, let elephants touch their cars, which is an amazing experience, yes, but something will go wrong. It's not, it's not if, it's when. And what happens if you do let animals that into the space when you can obviously see he's behaving slightly differently from what another elephant bull would do, uh, and he does get a little bit overexcited or whatnot and someone gets hurt. That sort of signs a, a death warrant for that animal because it will have to be destroyed because now it is a danger to humans. So that's why I did that little thing there and that's definitely why I wanted to watch his behavior. And it was very strange. He stood, we were probably a lot further away uh, than we often would have gone with elephants. We were about 30, 40 meters and he came to us and as we tried to just move away slowly, he would sped up and that's when the first snap on the door happened. But I didn't feel like we were in danger at any point there. And it was just uh, having, having a, giving him a little lesson in etiquette. But as I said, if you keep letting animals do that type of behavior, even though it is very exciting for those that are on the vehicle or for you guys watching, at the end, there is that he is going to do something uh, it might be to a vehicle full of people uh, and people get very scared and some of the people might not understand elephant behavior or, or know what they're doing i'm talking about the, obviously about the, the guests not the guides and someone screen shouts moves in the wrong way and that elephant gets even more agitated and someone gets hurt and of course we don't want that he's a beautiful big bull in his prime so just teach him a little bit of etiquette Now, speaking about elephant bulls that need a little bit of teaching and etiquette, uh, we had an elephant bull who decided that our little garden was a good place to spend his time. And X Rang is wondering whether he's moved on now. And he has. With the rain coming and there being greenery all over the place, he's decided that after destroying our very beautiful buffalo thorn that I used to look and admire from my deck, it is now split in two that there's enough food out in the bush for him to go find. He also managed to put a foot through the pool deck. So fortunately, now with that bit of rain, there's a little bit less pressure on the animals and he's moved off. Genevieve in New York. Uh, Genevieve would like to know whether he urinated out of excitement or coincidence. I think that was just coincidence. Um, he's just been drinking quite a lot of water and you must also remember when elephant bulls are in must like that, uh, they can they lose just from the dripping about 80 to 90 liters of fluid in a day. So nearly, now I'm gonna try to remember, I think it's about 20, 20 gallons around there of water. Maybe not as much as 20 gallons, I'm trying to remember now. But they do lose a lot of water. Or oh, moisture in a day when they, when they, when they are in must. But I, I think that urination just happened to be uh, coincidental. Uh, and you can see what he was doing there. He just was testing his luck, trying his luck, seeing if I, I would uh, let him come closer and closer. I didn't feel in any way he was being very aggressive, more just playful. So we're going to head off to the east. I'm going to check through the Mawati River system again. Uh, hopefully, Kamula has crossed in her hunting last night. And let's see if it'd be really nice to catch up with her. Of course, we will always be very careful around her at the moment, uh, especially that she, since she's got cubs. But while we go look for a leopard, 
Let's go jump back on board with Jamie and the sleeping in couples. Oh, right. What a perfect time for you to have come across as the lionesses roll across into each other and act very, I could only describe it as cutesy. One of those moments where you watch lions and all you can think of is your domestic pet cats and they roll over and cuddle themselves with their paws. And that's a very common perception of lions when you see them sleeping and resting like this or cuddling or playing together until you witness them in full hunt and stalk mode, which point that perception changes very, very rapidly. Or indeed when you get growled at on foot. It's a very intimidating sound that the lions generally on foot are not a threat to people. We are, during the day that is, we're very much a dominant species over them. We're the apex predator during the day. So when they see us walking towards them, what, most of the time what they do is move off very quickly, which of course we try not to do. And in fact, the Inkahumas have relaxed more and more on foot, we've noticed. And I've had a couple of sightings now where I've gone tracking them and stood probably about easily 100 meters away, so far away from them still, which is 100 meters is about 300 feet, uh, roughly. I'm not sure what that is in yards, but they're perfectly comfortable with that. They'll watch you for a while, and then actually there's a couple of the older females will lie down and relax once again. But if you ever happen to stumble upon a lion, it does sometimes happen where you get a little bit too close to them, maybe you've surprised them, you, they will give you a deep, booming growl. And it's at that point that you are thrown back to your origins at the time before man became the apex predator. And it's then very important to clamp down on that desire to move very rapidly away from them. We always speak about not running. Oh, those lionesses look so comfortable. Back legs in the air. If they did make a kill last night, and I don't think that they did, it was a very small one, probably something like an impala. And already, the, the plague of a lioness, the flies assaulting their ears, you see ears twitching, they've also descended upon Veerman and myself, already at this early hour of the morning. Uh, I've mentioned that these are the Inkuhuma lionesses and I spoke about the Styx lionesses as well. And Century was wondering what is the difference between the Inkuhumas and the Styx? Well, first of all, welcome to the Sunrise Safari, Century. We'd love to hear where you are from. One of the interesting things about our YouTube audience is that sometimes we don't always get an idea of just how far across the globe we are reaching. So Century, if you could please let us know, that would be wonderful. Now, the difference between the Inkahumas and the Styx females is, first of all, the size of the pride and the fact that they are completely separate prides. So the Inkahumas, although their territory overlaps with that of the Styx, they are five females strong. Initially, when I first started working here, that was eight members of this pride. And before that, around February last year, it was nine. The Birmingham Boys, the coalition of young males, were responsible for the death of two adult lionesses and a sub-adult lioness during the course of last year and in the course of their takeover. A case, I think, we think, of the Inkahumas attempting to protect their youngsters, so the sub-adults, and the young male that was with them as well, who was nicknamed Junior. And that eventually resulted, the combination of inexperience and hormones from the side of the Birmingham boy result, boys resulted in a great deal of undue aggression in the sort of start of their takeover. That's completely settled down now, but it has reduced this pride to five members. Now the sticks, generally occur further to the south, but their territory does overlap with that of the Inkahumas. There's an overlap around Arethusa and our southern boundary. So one of the other properties that we drive on to the west, 
and our southern boundary is where the Inkahumas and the Styx territory really does overlap, all the way across to Cheetah Plains and Inkoro, all the way to the east of us. And the Inkahumas and the Styx have encountered each, other's, each other before. The fact that there were five Inkahumas at the time, whereas there were three Styx in that particular pride, meant that the um, the Inkahumas actually not not beat up, but they they did rough up the sticks a little bit and sent them packing on their way. The sticks, to me, in terms of physical differences, they probably look if you go back far enough in terms of the genetics of the lions, prides of this area, it could be that the sticks were at some point, and I'm going back far. I'm talking a hundred years or so. They might have been an offshoot of the Inkahumas or vice versa. Lionesses are, the, as Steph termed it, and I think it was a brilliant way of terming it, lionesses are the guardians of their genetic line. But sometimes prides, sometimes prides <laughs> split off into different directions and they become different prides completely. Blah. Attempt to, attempting to talk this time in the mornings, so it doesn't always work that well. That being said, whether or not they are related, if you go back far enough, there are distinct physical differences to me, personally. I think that the sticks are bigger, not in terms of height, in terms of bulk. And I know that Brent agrees with me, there's something I, I would almost describe as stocky for the sticks lionesses, whereas with the Inkahumas, the Inkahumas are, ge in general, a little bit younger than the sticks that we've been seeing particularly that older female, older Styx female, who's a bit tatty looking. But there are two youngish Styx females, and they initially had cubs when I first started working here, when actually, when I first came for the job interview in June last year. They had three little cubs. Unfortunately, similar story to the Inkahumas, the Birmingham boys did what male lions do and took care of the three cubs, which is why it's so nice to see the sticks as pregnant as they are. So think of, in terms of female home ranges and territories, and females are territorial, as I said, when they encounter each other, they do have a lot to say, and quite a great, a, quite a, a serious amount of aggression can be shown between different lion prides. But think of them almost as sort of, not as puzzle pieces, but their home ranges as fluid and quite flexible in terms of the boundaries. And then what will happen then, there, is that the, the Nkumas will move about in their little territory, or quite a large territory or home range. The Sticks will move about in their home range. And in the Birmingham Boys territory, so the male coalition's territory, expands across the Nkuhumas territory, the Sticks territory, and all the way to the east. They've got a very large territory, but there are five of them. In, within this particular area. And never think of, we, we have this traditional view that a lion pride is some females and a male or two males that go with that lion pride exclusively. That's not the case. Let's just see how this situation's gonna play out. Have they been spotted by the guinea fowl at the back? Nope. Wait for it, wait for it. Surely one of them must have spotted the lion by now. I love watching guinea fowl and predator interaction. Okay. Bye-bye, guinea fowl. Well, that's the last time I rely on guinea fowl to tell me if there's cats in the area and just walk straight past. I was hoping they might do their alarm call. I've seen them do it with Tingana and then sort of have a complete short-term memory loss, start eating seeds around him and then suddenly realize that he's still there and start alarm calling again. And they can be highly entertaining. In this particular case though, they've skipped past the termite mound and gone straight past the lions without even, I don't think they even spotted them. Generally though, lions not a threat to guinea fowl, not in the same way a leopard is. I have, I've heard of one or two instances where a lion has attempted to catch a guinea fowl, but for the most part they don't have the agility that leopards have, and basically it's not really worth it. A lioness is much larger than even the largest male leopard. Why really bother with a meal of a guinea fowl? It's not going to yield much in the way of food. One of my approaches to, 
approaching lions on foot, I would figure that I wouldn't really be worth their time. But speaking of meals and potential prey, Clayton was wondering, oh, big cuddle. I love the way they hug themselves when they stretch. It's actually a way of stretching the shoulder muscles and the, the tendons in the paws. Just in the same way when we are lying in bed, we do that big stretch and it feels wonderful for us. And the exact same applies to them. And a way of keeping limber, because you've got to get up at some point, ladies, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. But you've got to be able to, if you're a lioness, you've got to be able to go from sleeping to utilizing any opportunity to catch prey whenever you can. And Clayton was wondering, since they are a bit empty-bellied, how long can a lioness go without making a kill, or how long can lions go without feeding? And the answer is fairly easily about a week. And they start to get, start to look very rangy and quite thin. But they can go for longer than that. Um, I'm not sure of an exact time period. It depends, of course, on the condition of the animal and the size of the animal and what they exactly sort of what movements they are doing. Now, I've known of lion, they, lions that have gone for two weeks without a meal, at which point they are looking very hungry. Now, Clayton, if you've ever seen the shimungues, you would get an idea of just how resilient these animals are. So the shimungues, originally an enormous and very successful pride, now reduced by a combination of um, hyena attacks as well as attacks by the Ottawa pride, have uh, been reduced to two sub-adult females and one sub-adult male. That at the time that they were left all alone, were far too young to be all that experienced in hunting. Now even these Nkuhuma lionesses that have had plenty of practice in the experience of the years in terms of hunting technique, even they miss, as I mentioned before, or even they have a very low success rate. So you can imagine for the sub-adults of the Shimungwe pride, not an easy existence. And yet they struggle on and they're still, they've been seen recently towards Mala Mala. The little male, still about, Viam and myself nicknamed him Oliver, just because he looked so, he, he struck quite a, a pathetic, in the broader sense of the word, figure. Big cuddle. And they go from probably scavenging from carcass to carcass and from lion kill to lion kill, dodging the attentions of the other lions, managing to survive in that way. But they, all three of them look exceptionally thin. And yet they are able to eke out a survival And Safari Dean is on the side of the Nkuhuma lionesses. He's saying that he feels their reluctance to stir. We'll see. We shall see. I'm predicting that at least one of them will get up at some point. Really, playing my bet's pretty safe there. Surely that should be a safe bet. But we'll see. Hopefully they call for us or they might get up and start seeing if they can hunt again. You never know, we'll just have to sit patiently and wait to find out. In the meantime, why don't you jump onto Brent's vehicle and see what's happening on his side. Oh, nope, in that case, nope. You won't be going onto Brent's vehicle because he is struggling due to a lack of comms with final control. So you could, you could jump onto the back of his vehicle, but he wouldn't know that you were there. Always the possibility of entertainment, but not really what we're going for. Now, I sympathize with him. I'm having a bad earpiece day, which is the equivalent of a bad hair day. And it's just that the earpiece really, no matter what I try, no matter which direction I put it in, really doesn't want to stay in my ear this morning. And I don't understand, because it was perfect when I left it. And I've gone to put it back on this morning, and it just won't sit properly. Most infuriating. No, oh, man, now it's out completely. I've totally messed this up. I've tried clipping it higher on my collar. I've tried putting it lower on my collar. I've tried putting it down the back of my shirt. I've tried putting it down the front of my shirt. Neither of those options is working. Uh, we'll just have to deal with me grabbing it every now and again. And absolutely, Kevin, 
Kevin was wondering about the calls that he heard last night and was saying, could it have been two different prides? Because some sounded very faint and some sounded close. There's so many options, Kevin. Last night when we went to bed, there were lions calling from Simbombili, or what sounded like Simbombili. I mean, that's a rough estimate as to where they are. This could have been the Nkuhumas moving around there. Then they, these four might have been calling, which is probably the ones you heard close. The further ones could have been the mating pair in Torchwood, so the other Nkuhuma lioness and the Birmingham boy, or some of the other Birmingham boys a little bit further away. I'm not quite sure where they've decided to settle down for the morning. But you know that they'll be somewhere in the vicinity. So absolutely, Kevin Catfish. They, it could well have been several sets of calls. And I suspect that it was, just from listening to what we heard last night. Really nice to hear the females vocalizing again. It was a, an extended period of time in which we really didn't hear them. And then straight after the Birmingham boys conducted their takeover, they managed to, or they went very, I can only describe it as they went under the radar. They went exceptionally quiet, they didn't call. I, from, from the start of the Birmingham boys takeover in August, right up until, I feel right up until the last, only the last few weeks, have we really properly heard the Nkuhumas vocalizing. I wonder, it's going to be very tricky, but as they start to move into view, we've got a whole flock of what looks like a myrrh falcons. Thank you, Vian. Not the easiest angle at all, but really pretty to see in this morning light. Uh, a myrrh falcons and red-footed kestrels, the only sociable small raptors moving about in groups. And although it's very difficult for you to see, there's probably about 20 or so, more actually, looks to be about 30 of them flying through the sky. So a myrrh falcons. And in that brief moment that we Vim did a brilliant job in getting you a view, you can see the, the sharpness to the, the shape of the wing. That it was the a myrrh falcons. And that's obviously built like, built for speed, built for speed. That is the falcon's, or that's the falcon's best adaptation and what they have over all other birds. Peregrines, of course, being the fastest and one that we could see here, uh, it's the last time I saw one was in Kruger towards the north, but they are around. You never know when we might encounter a peregrine or a lana falcon, a little bit larger than the Amurs and solitary. Only the Amur, and by Amur I'm saying A-M-U-R, just to clarify the South African accent for you, in case that's a little bit cryptic. Now, oh, the other difference between the Inkahumas and the sticks, to go sort of back to centuries question, is the fact that the sticks seem to be more or, or seem to be showing more symptoms of TB, not completely confirmed and obviously can't be confirmed without a veterinary diagnosis. But one of the females has a swelling on her elbow that is known as hyper... Oh, goodness. This word keeps going out of my mind. It's a, it's a, a growth of sorts associated with tuberculosis. The Inkahumas are a very clean-looking very healthy pride. But Joe was wondering whether it's possible for lions to get a cold or a fever. It's an interesting one, Joe. Certainly they are capable of contracting viruses, just like domestic cats that are able to contract the essentially the, the, the feline equivalent of feline HIV, so FIVS, feline immunodeficiency virus. It'd be interesting to know, they of course do not complain in the same way we do when we get a temperature and are feeling a little bit sickly. And in fact, even with a TB, they continue on as they would always. But yes, I think it's entirely possible that they would feel ill, particularly most of them are carriers of tuberculosis. One of them is making a very strange sound, sort of a purring sound that I could hear. I'm not sure which individual it was. Brrr. 
very much sounds like she's purring in contentment. But since they are not showing any signs of standing up anytime soon, it sounds as though Brent is back in the world of communication. Let's try that again. Why don't you hop on the back of his vehicle? We were trying to find you, a little red-back shark, but he keeps disappearing. Uh, I'm sorry about that, folks. Unfortunately, I think, I don't know, my knee or something popped and I changed off the radio channel. I was also very confused why I wasn't hearing anything. I'm trying to see. I can hear him still, but we can't see him. Yeah, that chip, 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 chip. That's the little male red back shrike. Let's see if we move a skosh forward. Can we spot him? Nope, he's decided to move on. I'll keep an eye out. They're quite pretty little birds. As I said that, he pops into the open. You see him there, Dave? There. There he is. You can see that very prominent red back. It's a, one of the shy species that will actually hang insects from thorns. It's his little tail going. He's playing quite heavily. I wonder if he's looking for ladies. You can see that tail flitting around quite nicely there. There he goes, showing you his nice red back. Now, this is one of our migratory species. Oh, there we go. If he goes a little bit further. Now, if I remember correctly, our viewers in the UK might even see these at home during your summer months. So one of the species that loves the eternal summer, spending summer in the northern hemisphere and summer in the southern hemisphere. Never finding winter. Well, the females don't have as prominent a red back, but still very pretty birds nonetheless. I can't see any females around. Oh, off he goes. <laughs> So we're right in the southeastern corner of the reserve at the moment. And the reason for that being, we're hoping Karilla has crossed over the boundary, so we're just checking for tracks carefully. Now, the other reason we checked that eastern boundary was that there was the last in Kahuma lioness who was mating with the Birmingham, probably about a kilometer to the east of our traverse area, and I was hoping maybe they've decided that Juma is a good honeymoon spot, but unfortunately not. Jared, who's on Twitter, is wondering if our cars have horns or hooters, and would we use them for an encounter such as that? I'm not even sure if they work. Should we try? Oh, it does work. Um, yes, it, that is also uh, something we could 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 use. But uh, for some reason, I found that that hooters seem to in, uh, infuriate elephants more than than not. And I've always found. That sort of sound seems to work the best. Oh, and I know those who were on the sunset safari saw some of these with the gems. Now, this is the third time I've seen them flowering. They must have been very confused this season. And it's a baboon's tail. There we go. There's some nice little flowers next to Dave there. Very beautiful uh, when they are flowering. And they've got those lovely green leaves. But during the majority of the year, they look like a little dry stick with nothing on them. But quite nice to see them. Let's have a quick 
quick closer look in the fire there. This sort of delicately light, what color would you call that, Dave? Pinkish or mauve? I don't know if it's mauve. I'm not quite sure on all my colors. Anyway, final control thinks it would be lilac. But very, 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 very pretty. Um, I just heard uh, final control suddenly go, oh, goodness. Uh, that same elephant is literally sitting on the, at their pedestrian gate. Uh, fortunately, there's quite a nice fence around there. Uh, so I don't think he's going to come visit them. If he does, he'll be taught another le lesson in etiquette, uh, not by any one of us, but by uh, 9,000 volts. Generally quite effective in teaching an elephant manners, an electric fence. This elephant has decided to block the road. See, I'm not going to attempt to try and move that <coughs> thorny mess. Wilson. Uh, B. Wilson says the nighttime sounds. I'm sorry, the, the morning door chorus of all the birds is so wonderful, even though it is nighttime uh, where they are. Uh, but And the bird sounds are acting as a lullaby because B. Wilson is getting a little sleepy. Well, I couldn't think of much better sounds to go to sleep to. And uh, even the nocturnal sounds we get to experience on a nightly basis make for the best lullaby. I like to sleep with all the windows, everything open, so I can hear as much as possible outside. And we do have a wonderful little Scops owlet that sort of seems to like calling from the marula tree just outside our bedroom. He sits there going, burp, burp, burp. And of course, fiery neck nightjar. Good Lord, deliver us. Uh, we're just checking very carefully in this little section. Uh, Karula is seen about 100 meters south down about there. So maybe she's come up to the north. So Lucy in Indiana said we had lions yesterday. And Lucy, we have lions again today. Uh, Lucy says she feels like it should be wild dogs on the cards today. I, of course, agree with you wholeheartedly, Lucy. Unfortunately, the last update I had on uh, wild dogs is that they were very, very far to the south of us, um, actually quite close to Skokuza, so way down that way. Uh, I know quite a few of you will be interested. I have mentioned that Karula has moved her den, but this is the spot before the rain where she was keeping those little cubbies in that stormwater drain. There it is there, under one of the busiest roads in the Sabi Sands. I'm sure quite a few of you were interested in that and quite apt since we are on the hunt for the queen. So from what I understand, she's moved her den further to the south into this myriad of little dongas. A donga is a, is a sort of erosion gully, is the best way to describe it. These are natural uh, just from rain and whatnot, and fortunately, no one can get a car into there. There's a good example. You can see no one's driving in there, and there's a whole host of them. 
so near impossible to get a vehicle in. So that's good news, and she should keep the, the cubs in an area like that till they're old enough. Sherry, good morning. Sherry is in California. And there. It's also a nice sunny place like we are. And Sherry is wondering, do any succulent varieties of plants grow here? Uh, yes, Sherry, we do have a few, not that many. And the most prominent one I think we see, and we showed you quite a lot during uh, the winter months last year, is the narrow-leaved calancho. And uh, that is a, the, one of our only wintering flowering plants uh, that is a succulent and the other one which i will try to find an example one one or both of the two most common ones today sherry is uh, the san severa or mother-in-law's tongue is its common name and that's quite an interesting one because it's a very big bulbous root system that retains water and in desert areas that the sand or the bushman actually extract water from the roots of that plant. So, let's have a look. Can we see any tracks in the riverbed? Or even better, can we spot a leopard in the riverbed? Unfortunately, not. I'm just gonna jump across to the Eastern Channel, see if there is any update on her, if she's still that side. Morning mobile stations. Is any station in the east copying me? Morning, Sid. Uh, just to update you guys, uh, in Kahuma Pride are around a Philemon's dip. Uh, is there any, been any update on Karula? Ah, uh, Kobe, thanks very much. Now, She's not visiting us, she's still visiting the south, but I've spotted something that might be of interest. And now, unusual to see them moving like this. I didn't want to drive over them. Let's go have a closer look. Aha, 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 aha. There's a column of ants. And I've actually never seen this species of ant move like this. I'm just gonna jump out of the car. So what I think is they're actually moving home. I'm just gonna have a closer look. Is that, can you guys see if there's any, they're carrying any little white things? And that would be their eggs. Let me just have a look. These look like sugar ants. Um, quite often around human habitation. Let's have a closer look. Oh, and you can see, um, is my finger in? Dev? Yep. You can see the guys with the big black heads and the soldiers and the workers. Now, this is very interesting. Normally, you see them coming in and out of a hole, but here, they're crossing the road. It almost does look like they're moving house, but I can't see any uh, eggs being carried. Maybe this is just a large foraging party. I'm not sure. And I'm not 100% convinced that these are sugar ants. I'm not sure what ant species these are. So guys, grab some screenshots, send them to me so I can uh, try identify them later. Very interesting. See, it doesn't look like a foraging party. It definitely looks like, come guys, let's move house. Maybe they've been raided by a more aggressive ant species like the Matabili ant, and they've decided that wherever they were, it's a bit too dangerous to live in, and they're gonna move on. Hmm. Fascinating stuff.
So as you can see up ahead, there's this dark gray bank. And Ellen in North Dakota would like to know if we're driving into a storm. It looks so foggy and gray. Uh, I don't think it's a storm, Ellen, or not yet anyway. It just looks to be some low cloud. Uh, hopefully, fingers crossed that there's a bit of moisture in it and we might get some rain. Now, here we go. Hello, Impalalas. Now, I noticed quite nicely on some of the little impalas that their little horns are starting to show quite nicely. Let's see if we can find a little male amongst these guys. Hello, impalalas. Is that little boy there? And to the left? No. Yes? Is his horn so small I can barely see them? Yes. Um, a little bit more to the left. That one, that soon. Oh. Ah, oh, now the males. Oh, look at this go! The rut is starting. So that is a young male in front of us there. And then the big male. Oh, here we go. We're gonna run right. Get away from my ladies. Uh, you can see that this, the one doing the chasing, nice big male in his prime, and the other male was looking a little bit skinny, a little bit younger, horns not quite as big, but there's always a chance that those younger males, while the other males are fighting or chasing, might be able to, be able to sneak in for a, a quick mating. <laughs> and don't you come back here. So we're going to start seeing a lot more of that behavior. There we go. Oh, yes, you're very strong. Beat that. Beat the stick. Now, there's a bit of a dominance display going on now after he's vanquished the intruder. Now, speaking of males, let's try to look what we were originally looking for before pandemonium ensued. So let's just zoom in on that little group there. See if we can spot. There's a little girl walking towards us. There's a little boy. You can just see those tiny little horns starting to pop up. Now, when their horns are like a little bit longer than this, uh, the Afrikaans people have a nickname for them. It's called a pen corp. Basically, a pen head. Looks like he's got two little pens sticking out of his head. Lucy in Indiana is wondering, do any of the animals eat all the flowers that we show you? Uh, certain species, yes, but a lot of them, no. But they're all eaten by different types of insects. Now, if I remember correctly, from, there it is, from last year. There were a couple of those succulents around here. Here we go. There it is. The narrow-leaved calancho. Now, during the winter months, they get a wonderful tall stalk. And this is for sherry in California. So there we go. You can see it's a very much a succulent. There's thick, juicy leaves. Uh, not eaten by very much apart from insects and, and has been known to cause crimp sicta in domestic livestock. I've never seen any wild game feeding on it. But so, in the, in the, I might even have a decent picture actually. In the winter months, they get a long stalk that comes out from the base and beautiful orange uh, flowers on it. And there we go. So I'm not sure whether this one's actually got the narrow-leaved or one of the other Calancha species. There's a couple in these parts. Uh, this is a different one. Uh, this one generally occurs on, on higher ground, unfortunately, and uh, called a white lady or a broad-leaved Calancha. 
So we've got the narrow leaf down here in, in the lower fault. Not that one, that doesn't occur here, Def. <laughs> that one there. <laughs> but that's one of them. Have a quick look in the back, see if we do have the narrow leaves in this book. Otherwise, actually, I do know where I have it. Ha ha! And I especially brought my flower books out with me today. And it's Kalancho with a K, not with a C. There we go. That's the beautiful flowers we get uh, during the winter months. Very, very pretty. And it's used tra in traditional medicine uh, for colds and blocked sinuses. And it's said to make you sneeze. So it's used in snuff quite often, mixed in with snuff, and revo results in severe sneezing, which is said to help clear the head. So it is a toxic plant, and the, the toxin in it uh, is a cotyledon toxin. So anyway, it causes crimp sicta, or the shrinking disease in cattle and domestic livestock. So when they eat it, they tend to almost shrivel up uh, so not very good uh, to eat but as i said quite often a lot of the noxious plants in very small doses are used in a traditional medicine especially with purging uh, and, and things like that so poison sometimes can be good for you but only in the correct dosages and you always wonder how we've always got these dosages it uh, must have been a lot of trial and error and i wonder how many people have expired with uh, different medical practitioners testing dosages of lethal plants. But on a happier note, let's go to the five lovely ladies uh, and the wildebeest, Viem, uh, who are still sitting somewhere off Philemon's dip. Still with our lovely ladies. Not that our lovely ladies have decided to stir all that much. Looking very rested and relaxed. Now, I've tried lying on ground like this, and it is exceptionally uncomfortable. It's one of those things that, as humans, I guess we've just been spoiled with all our couches and cushions and mattresses. We're not capable of looking as comfortable as a lion or a leopard might be whilst lying on the ground. I mean, have you ever seen anything looking so relaxed? There you can see the flies buzzing around her. And looking at them a little bit closer, definitely empty-bellied. Spines a little bit prominent. A very dignified cat-like pose. Legs in the air, looking perfectly relaxed. This lady rolled over across to face us. You'll probably find that they covered an enormous distance last night whilst trying to hunt, which is why they are so exhausted now, because it's not a hot morning. It's actually quite a, a mild morning. That's a good question. Lenny in Pennsylvania heard me calling in the lion sighting and I was chatting to Brent and I said that the lions were Lalapanzi, which is, I know that I'm going to get, um, what's the word, berated from by Brent when I get home, just for the way in which I pronounced that. So Lalapanzi, you've looked up and you said it's a place in Zimbabwe. You were wondering what it refers to when I was chatting about the lions. What the lions are doing right now is lalapanzi. It means that lying down or sitting down. In this case, very much lying down. They are lalapanzi. I'm pretty sure it's actually lalapanzi. The HL sound in 
in most of, now I've said Lala Panzi just because it's an easy way and it's the way in which we've sort of, I've got into a bad habit of speaking, but the HL sound in most of the local languages, and of course there are tremendous differences depending on where you are in the country, the way in which you pronounce things, but it is Lala Panzi lying down. Somebody's just trying to get hold of me. Oh. There we go. Brent responding for me. So that is what it is, Larry. Slalapanzi, lying down. And that's why I said I'm going to get into trouble for the way that I pronounced it. It's quite easy. The, the way in which we speak on the Game Drive channel and the, the terminology that we use is such a mishmash of different local languages. So it's almost to be considered a norm all in its own. So they're the industry standards of the way in which you refer to animals. Now, we referred to these four ladies as Ngala, Ngala, meaning lion, and I referred to them as Mufazi, which actually means woman lion. It's not actually the word, the, the local Shangon word for female. It means woman, as in a human woman. Now, that's just one of the ways in which it's become an inaccurate usage of the language, but something that has standardized through lodges throughout the world. And for most local speakers, not so much the Shangan language, but if you go further to the west of us, when you refer to an Ingala, it's not actually the local name for a lion. The local name is Tau, T-A-U, in Sutu, or in Spedi as well. And the different peoples come with their different types of language, but due to the way in which South Africa has evolved and come to be oh, rolling over, there are different, there are combinations of language. And then you may have heard the term Funagalore. Now Funagalore refers to essentially what I was saying there is it's amber eyes that's rolled over to us. Now that her eyes are actually vaguely open as she watches Ephraim approach. We can see who she is, rolling over to observe him. Morning, everyone. Hi. Oh, a fly bugging her. Hello, gorgeous girl. But yes, Fana Galore is one of those, essentially what I was saying, which is a combination of all kinds of different languages, including English and Afrikaans, as well as all of the other local dialects. It's something that I've always wanted to master. Unfortunately, I don't. Well, I say this, it's probably not entirely accurate. I've always considered myself to have a serious lack of ability when it comes to learning languages. But perhaps it's just I should have put more effort in, especially whilst younger. It always helps to learn a language when you're younger. Look <laughs> at rubbing your chest like that. We spoke a bit about Kevin Catfish's question as to whether or not he was hearing different groups of lions call, and I said that that was almost certainly the case, and that he could well have been hearing not just these ladies, but also males a bit further off. And Mo Khan was wondering, can you hear the difference between a male and a female call? And Mo Khan, the answer is yes, you can, to an extent. I sometimes battle with it. The further away the lion is, the harder I find it in terms of identifying. Now, what I've noticed with male lions versus female lions, whilst the pitch is very similar, so it's not that the male lions is much deeper than the females, but it tends to be a difference in the way in which they vocalize. So all lions do that long hmm sound, and then at the end they go hmm, hmm, hmm. And that call, those little shorter calls, for me, the males tend to go on a little bit longer than the females. Not always that easy, though, Mo Khan. Let's see what I mean about being very... I think the Nkuhumas are very attractive lions. They've got a beautiful tawny coat. They are wonderfully symmetrical, which sounds like a, the most bizarre thing to say. 
But when you've seen an asymmetrical lion, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And still, retaining those spots of youth, even at Amber Eyes' age, and I would guess at maybe, probably about seven or eight. It's in light like this that you can actually see see the spots I'm talking about. Now Amber Eyes opened up her eyes giving us a really nice glance at her very distinctive, at least within this pride, very distinctive feature. We've also got a comment from one of the viewers about the spot on Amber Eyes' neck and Connie you were saying you've noticed that and use it to identify her. Look at her face now, she's also got a scar on her cheek. But I'm pretty sure that spot on her neck is actually a scar, and as well as the one on her cheek. That one on the cheek might be a patch of mud, but I think it's just an old scab or a scar. Lionesses often injure themselves. It could have been inflicted by one of her pride mates. It could have been inflicted by the animal that she was attempting to tackle. And you can even see the flies settling there and irritating her a little bit. So Connie, it's perfect for now to use that as an identifying feature. Just bear in mind that with any animal with the scars, they will, that will change over time. Very often scars disappear as an identifying feature. The most accurate way of identifying individual lines, unless you've got really clear missing teeth, which often works, is to look at the spot patterns of the whiskers. And that is the same throughout their lives. That never changes, that never heals. You can see how distinctive those black dots are around her nose, particularly the top row in leopards is what's focused on. But with lions, I've actually personally found it easier to look at the combination of the spot patterns as a whole. The more time you spend looking at them, the easier it gets. And if we look at Amber Eyes's ear, a little bit further there, you can see, now I'm not looking at the nick on the left hand side of her ear, so on your left. That's not what I'm looking at. All lions have that little notch or curve in their ear. I'm actually looking as the ear curves up to the right and starts to descend between the two flies. And I want the part that's touching that grass strand. That is a, an identifying feature in itself. That nick, that scar, will never close up and heal completely. And of course, her bright orange eyes. But bear in mind, let's say we encountered a lioness with amber eyes somewhere on the road or on her own without the rest of the pride. Unless we looked at the different, if, unless we looked at the different factors together, so for example, that nick in her ear, her spot patterns, we wouldn't actually be able to confirm just by looking at her eyes alone. There are lionesses with eyes as orange as amber eyes in different prides. I think one of the Styx females has also got a fairly, fairly orangey eyes. And that's one of the interesting things about the, the way in which people identify lions. It's what gives people the ability to identify, for example, Junior, even far away from his pride. And apparently he is cruising around Kruger enjoying his time around Skakuza, but it is what gives people that ability to say, yes, that is definitely Junior for sure. But that has to be, can only be confirmed by looking really closely at the spot patterns because with as many lions as you have, and this does have one of the highest lion densities in Africa, with as many lions as you have here, you just have to be exceptionally careful in terms of identifying him. I'm not saying it's not him. I'm just saying that's what gives us the ability to tell the difference between him and another young male. Now, lionesses, you're proving me my predictions wrong here. Not up to terribly much. I think I'm going to spend a little bit more time with them. But actually, I'll tell you what, I'll leave it up to you guys whether you would like to stay or to go. We'll do one more segment with them and then we'll decide from there depending on your votes. Some things to consider whilst you sum up what you would like to do. It is cool this morning. It is cloudy this morning. There are lots of animals around quarantine, so there's always the chance that the lionesses could get lucky. They might get up. 
then again, so far they've shown a considerable reluctance to move. So I'll put it to you whether you would like to stay or to go. And while you make up your mind in that a particular case, why don't you jump onto the back of Brent's vehicle? Sorry, sorry, pulling down the sleeves here, it's got a little bit more chilly as the morning's worn on. And the clouds seem to be getting thicker. So maybe there's a little moisture in there and hopefully it holds out until after the sunrise safari. So Karula, unfortunately, still in the, in, the, in the south. So what I've done is I've come to sort of the southwestern corner and we're just gonna have a little gander along the western edge of the traverse. We might go into Arethusa, depending on what tracks we find or what updates we get. There we go, here is the southern edge and there is the southwestern corner where we're heading towards. So we've got some St. Paddy's Day requests. Uh, James Richard would like an emerald spotted wood dove and Marianne would like a shamrock. Well, I don't know if we're going to find a shamrock all the way this far away from the Emerald Isle, but we shall definitely try. I think I have a, a solution to the shamrock and I will keep my eyes appealed for the emerald spotted wood dove. So we've been chatting about Karula, who's down in the south. Now, one of our other resident female leopards who's with child at the moment, or not with child, has got child, is actually denning in this area in front of us here. So that area is obviously also still zoned, but we will do a little meander past. Maybe she's popped out for a, a bite to eat. You never know. A very warm safari live welcome to Andy and Julia in Los Angeles. Now, Andy and Julia would like to know, do leopard teach their cubs to hunt or is it mostly instinctual? Now, there's a lot of debate about this, but uh, having spent as much time as I have with leopards, there's very little teaching that goes on, uh, I would say 99% of it is instinctual. So quite often a lot of those skills are developed and honed when mom is away and they will chase like we saw with young Cindy there, um, chase Franklin, chase testiculars, climb up and down, run about, chase everything that moves. And I think that's more where the, the skills are honed than, uh, than actually being taught. Well, I just have to have a good morning here quickly as the vehicle comes past us. Morning, morning, morning. How's everyone this morning? Good morning, okay. Good, good thanks. Any updates on uh, Safari? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. There was a slumming globe apparently. Uh, yeah, I just saw them in Konzo. I didn't see them. Did they cross already or not yet? It looks like they've come out and see how it is, yeah. Uh, and then in Kumas on the side. Quarantine. <laughs> Cheers. Enjoy. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> okay, so just a quick morning meeting with Louis from Elephant Plans. So nothing uh, on Arethusa just yet. So we're going to keep checking along here. And so there's two possible leopard females we can find here. One is 
the shadow, of course, is Denny in this area. But as we carry on all the way right to the northwestern corner, there has been sightings of some new females just coming into the top corner of Juma. So we're going to go have a look around there if we get no joy in these parts. So, Siberia, good morning. Siberia, Zumi would like to know how often do leopards move their dens? It seems every time she's spotted, she moves her den. Uh, not, not quite, uh, but at this young age, she's probably moving them every three to four days. So, you probably don't see her for three to four days then being spotted. Oh, but across to a cat that's on the move with Jamie. Lots of yawning happening here. And one lioness has already got up and moved across in front of us. It's so interesting. The really interesting thing about this is that they actually heard the ox pickers, and I think Amber Eyes is up next. Here's another big yawn. And usually when lionesses do that, they are seriously thinking about standing up. Oh, gonna eat some grass, shame, to try and fill Probably settle an upset stomach caused by hunger. Look at that tick around her eye. Look at the ticks around her eye. That cannot be comfortable. But yes, what I was going to say is it's a really interesting thing about ox pickers. Here she goes. Oh, big stretch girl. That was a cool sound. Mm. Yes, those are empty bellies and a half. Almost gone wrinkly and flappy around her stomach. How are they going to get up and hunt? Now, the reason I keep trying to say about the oxpeckers is the fact that the oxpeckers started calling. Now, oxpeckers, of course, sitting on potential prey species for them, whether it's kudu, whether it is nyala or impala or zebra, whatever it may be. They, they heard the oxpeckers' movement and they know that there's an animal in here somewhere. They go on to go and investigate it. But first, eating a little bit of grass in front of us. <laughs> cool. We're going to do a bit of a VR segment at the same time. So bear with me for a sec. I just want to see if I can. There we go. Just beep it a little bit so I don't have to frighten them off. So right in front of us, we have a lioness. It's... If you look across behind the monkey orange, you can see her sniffing the ground. There's actually two there in front of us. There is the lioness close to the bonnet, and then the one behind her. Both of them looking very thin and incredibly hungry. I'm not sure what she's sniffing for. I think she's still eating grass. Just keep an eye on what she's doing there. I can't see her head from my perspective, but by looking downwards, you will be able to. You'll be able to see what she's up to. There we go. She's moved out a little bit into the open. And you can see the dense vegetation that they are moving about in. Off to the left of us. A very, very thick drainage line. And I think that they've heard a possible prey species somewhere in there. Just watching their body language. It's the most incredible feeling having these phenomenally, or the biggest predator in Africa, right up close to the vehicle. Another glorious start to a morning out in the bush. Cold and cloudy day means that they're going to be thinking about going on the hunt. It's not too hot for them. Here we go, a female moving behind the bush willow tree. She's going to slowly start heading off. I wonder what the morning holds for this lion pride. 
whether or not they will be successful in obtaining breakfast. Cool. Yeah. There we go. Thanks, everybody, for that. Just doing some narration of the VR or the virtual reality rig to put together a really nice clip to be able to publish. And then you can essentially, for those of you who haven't really had the virtual reality rig explained to you, basically gives you the ability, depending on what device you are using, to change the direction that you're looking at. So essentially gives you not just a 360 view, but a view to the sky, a view to the ground. Now the line is up. Let's go back to talking about them. All eating grass, and I'm sure that's from upset stomachs because they're hungry. Maybe they switched to grazing. <laughs> Fiam thinks they might have switched to grazing. Certainly easier than having to <laughs> having to head out on the hunt. <laughs> And Tammy, at the moment, the lionesses, given their hungry state, apart from this lazy lump, who is definitely straggling, <laughs> for these lionesses, they're actually going, could hunt at any time of the day or night because they are so hungry. It's gonna make them exceptionally opportunistic. Generally though, as a general rule, more than anything else, lions tend to hunt far more during the evening hours or the nighttime hours rather than during the day. That's usually because it is hotter. At the moment, it's nice and cool. The temperatures have dropped, so they don't have to worry too much about overheating. Although, that being said, I've seen this pride when they are hungry enough, hunt in easily over 30 degree temperatures. So over, what is that? Over close to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, when they really are feeling the need to. And they've shuffled around. And now they've popped themselves sort of behind the monkey orange. We're going to try and go around behind them so that we can get a view of them eating their grass. Hey, ladies. No, we're not. We're going to unimmobilize the vehicle first. There we go. There be girls. It's all right. You need to go find yourself some food. You haven't been taking care of yourselves. Shame. That's probably a bit unfair. They've probably tried all night to catch something to eat. Everybody watch your heads. It's gonna be a little bit noisy. Lucy watching in Indiana as we reposition. wanted a little bit of a, in a way of scale in terms of getting an idea of just how tall the lions are. And Lucy, when they walk close to the vehicle, they're not quite, the lionesses in particular, are not quite head height with us. Their head probably, actually, our head probably comes up to, their heads probably come up to about the door height at the top. We often see them walk right by us and they can turn and look slightly upwards into our eyes as they do. So what I'll do, Lucy, is once we have left the lions, depending on what happens or if we leave the lions, I don't want to now because they're actually getting up, looking like they're thinking about hunting. But what I'll do is I'll stand next to the vehicle and I'll show you exactly where a lion head sort of reaches, or a lioness head. Males, of course, when I encountered that Birmingham boy, oops, sorry, when I encountered that Birmingham boy, his head felt like it came up to about here, next to the vehicle. That might have just been the surprise element, though, as well. But lots of paw cleaning, shuffling around, and I'm again eating grass. Just like your cats and dogs, lions do it to quite often to make themselves throw up, but they can also do it to settle their stomachs. Even if just to, and I'm sure many of you have felt this before, when you are so hungry that you actually feel a little bit nauseous. And that might be why the lions are eating a bit of grass. They might even be looking for insects. Not impossible.
We've chatted a lot about the dynamics of this pride and the events that have led to the position that they find themselves in now. And Bud Petty was wondering, what would happen if a Birmingham boy decided to wander into the sighting now? Would there be any kind of aggression or displays of fighting? Or would it just simply be a case of greeting him? And the answer is probably they would just greet him. Now, we saw a couple of days ago, we had the reverse. We were sitting with the Birmingham boy and the Inkuhuma ladies just rocked up at the sighting, completely unexpected. And he looked up and he was a bit curious and they walked up and had a sniff. There wasn't an affectionate head rub or greetings of that nature that you usually see either between pride females or between males of a coalition. But there wasn't any real aggression. The only time he snarled at them was when they decided to try and go and have a nibble on his warthog kill. Not that he wanted it anyway, but that was what they decided to do. All of them, all four eating grass. Oh, oh I thought she was going to demonstrate the epicac type use, use that lions often put grass to. Let's try and change our angle a bit. They seem a bit indecisive about where they want to go. Definitely not the healthiest I have ever seen these lions. They are, and let me just clarify, although they are very hungry, they are not anywhere near starving. They are still have, they still have plenty of strength left in them. Uh, this is a normal hungry-ish looking lion. It's probably been about four or five days since they last had a meal. So they could go for longer. However, they're really starting to feel the pangs. Two. Two of them have remained behind, still munching away on grass. The other two are slowly wandering up towards quarantine onto the road. One has, one's following, the other is actually lying down behind a clump of bushes in the road. Somewhere there. Well done, Liam. There she is. Uh, they're definitely on the scout, on a scouting mission, if not a, a proper hunt just yet, on a scouting mission. Just to look at them, I can see how some of you might be a bit concerned. They do look very thin, but as I said, nothing too serious yet. Donna was wondering, because she's seen all of the ticks around them, she was wondering if there are any recorded cases of animals dying from tick bites. And Donna, generally not. Of course, our ticks don't transmit the Lyme disease that is quite as potent as it is in the States or in Europe. Our ticks transmit a rickettsia bacteria. It gives you a horrible fever and a bit of an ache. And most of the animals here are resistant to it. Us, as human beings, less so. It does affect us. But nothing a short course of antibiotics won't fix. And if you don't get the antibiotics, again, not serious. You're just going to feel really quite unpleasantly ill for a little while. Now, the only real case, and you can't really attribute this to ticks per se, is that when an animal has another underlying issue, for example, bad case of TB or some kind of growth, and then the ticks start to gather around the animal, it's, they are less focused on grooming themselves, and the ticks actually help to weaken and then hasten the death of an animal that is going to die anyway. But you can't really attribute that to the ticks per se. So generally a sick animal will have about twice the, I mean a sick and dying animal, like maybe that female warthog that we watched over the last few weeks, will have about twice the amount of ticks that a normal healthy animal of that size would have. One of the services that they perform, I must confess, not amongst my favorite animals, ticks. But as with everything out here, they serve their own valuable purpose, one of which is to remove weaker animals from the system 
as quickly as possible so that they do not reproduce and pass on weak genetics. Interesting. That was territorial spraying there, although she didn't scrape her feet in it. Shame, ladies. Hopefully something decides to wander across your path. Oh, Luke, watching in New York. Hi, Luke. You were wondering if there's any chance that a lion could starve to death from having unsuccessful hunts. Luke, I'm going to reposition while I answer. No, generally not. Lions, when they... Okay, yes, if it was, say, the Shemungwe pride that I was talking about earlier, young sub-adults, they might get to the point where they're too weak to... Un unusual for an animal to s or a lion to starve to death out here because something else will get it first but it could be to the weakened to the point that it can no longer fight back for example if hyenas decide to come calling we can go through here since the lions have moved off so luke that's a possibility generally most things don't have the opportunity of starving to death in an area like this so if a lioness breaks her leg for example and she can't keep up with the rest of her pride she might find herself alone and defenseless when it comes to attack by hyenas and hyenas being very good at having or picking up on other animals weaknesses but generally Within a pride, they will at some point be successful and they'll just keep hunting until they are. these lions stand. Let's go with that. Very common for lionesses to walk very close to each other if they have a specific purpose. Oh, Amber Eyes, you look like you want to. Yep. Here we go. Okay. Not a happy lioness. Oh, some dry heaving there. It didn't look terribly comfortable. Come on, ladies. Do your work, do your magic. A very experienced lion pride. They will definitely not be at risk of starving to death, but it's hard not to feel sorry for them when you see them looking fairly hungry in this particular state. Let's stay with the two that are walking. I want to just check whether or not there's any animals, and I know that, actually I know that there are animals on quarantine. I'm just wondering whether it wouldn't be a good idea now that these ladies are up to get Brent somewhere closer to the scene. Depending on where he is, it might be useful to have a second vehicle in this area. It's gonna happen slowly though, there's no rush for him to come across. As you know, half of the, most of the stalk is all about patience. Making sure they don't, they definitely don't want to mess anything up at this point. Hold on one second, I'm just going to get hold of Brent. Standing by. Copy, uh, these Ngala slowly mobile north to back towards quarantine. I'm not sure if you want to start making your way here. I'm not sure what's up on the clearing itself. Copy, will do. Turn, turned it up slightly too much. <laughs> slightly deafened myself there. Let's have a look and see. She looked up uncomfortably at me, which is why I changed my positioning. Oh, 
there's a tree branch in front of her face. I want to see if this is the lioness that apparently has two spots on her nose and has been referred to by one of our viewers or identified by one of our viewers as Spotty Nose. And Paige, look at all, oh, look at all those nicks around her ears. That's, that's quite a nice identifying feature on her right ear. Paige, I'm guessing this isn't the lioness you're referring to. This actually looks like it might be the sub-adult. She's very, very young. It's getting harder and harder to identify her. But just judging by the nervous way <coughs> she reacted as we tried to drive past her, plus that pink nose. There are young lions born with pinkish colored noses. Let's have a look at what bird Brent has found. Look at this, one of the most awesome little acceptors we get here. This is a dark, chanting goshawk. And Dave Richard, he nearly caught uh, the emerald-spotted wood dove we've been looking for. So he, I, we just saw, I just saw him plummet to the ground, chasing after that dove. He missed, and now he's looking a little sheepish on a fallen down knob thorn. But a really beautiful bird of prey. So quite a lot bigger than the Gabar goshawk, which we saw um, a few drives ago. They do share quite similar coloring in terms of their legs. Oh, there we go, look at that. Oh, what's he seen? He's on the ground. Can you see him nicely? Oh, I'm scared he flies. Ah. I'm just going to move a little bit further away from him, so if he has made a kill on the ground there, he feels safer to come have a look. So we're just going to move a little bit further away. You see him there? No. OK, and there he is. Oh. No, he's just in a really awkward spot for us. Maybe forward's better. So I think he's going to pop down onto the ground where he was. I'm just going to use my binoculars to examine said ground. Let's see if he's actually managed to catch a bird. Or maybe it's termites. Where'd he go? On the, on the ground. On the other side? Okay, sorry, I took my eyes off him for a second. Oh, there he is, he's behind the tree. So, judging the fact that he's not flying to the exact same place could mean there's some insects there that he's feeding off. Can't really see, there we go, he's walking. Oh, it's a snake, it's a snake. He's attacking a snake. Look at this. Look at him using those really sharp talons. Oh, isn't this fascinating? I'm kicking. I wonder what snake that is. It seems like it might have gone halfway down a hole and he's trying to pull it out. Snake escaped down the hole. What is going on here? So it did look like he was trying to pull something out. What do you find there, Mr. So 
So, with this cool weather and the amount of rain, it could be one of the blind snakes. We didn't see any really aggressive reaction from the snake and just try to get away. But has it got away? And it was quite big. I thought it was very big for him. I mean, it, it definitely looked quite massive. I almost thought maybe a Schlieben's blind burrowing snake. damage it managed to do with that, those kicks. Let's just watch this for a little longer. See if it flies off or it actually goes again. There we go. Look, look, he's going to check again. I think that snake has managed to get itself into a hole. the opportunist waiting to see if it gets another half chance you can see it looks like some termite diggings just in front of it there and maybe that snake managed to disappear down a hole okay well we're gonna see what how it plays out here but Jamie's got a very fascinating couple again. Look at this. This is incredible. So we had that amazing sighting with the six lionesses and the hinged tortoise, the tiny, tiny one that was completely ignored. Unfortunately for this one, I don't think he's going to or manage to get away from the situation, attract the interest of these lionesses. And they're now f f fighting over it. It was spotted by amber eyes. She went straight towards it. Mm. And she's decided to let the sub-adult have a lick. Oh, little tortoise, you've got very unlucky today. Speaks hinged tortoise that probably was just coming out of the termite mound where it had spent the evening. And encountered a playful lioness, a playful and hungry lioness, much larger than the one that we saw with the Dix females, and therefore of more interest, although it might be harder to crack open. And I wonder what these lionesses are going to do. Is this going to be their breakfast snack? Or is it going to escape as one slightly traumatized but very fortunate tortoise? It's up again, trying to flip it over. Something close to the edges. She's got her teeth around the edge of the shell. A lion probably not capable of crushing the shell with her bite force. And certainly doesn't want to risk damaging her teeth. But she will try to crack it open from inside the shell. Well, this is an interesting end to the tortoise saga. James and myself chatted a lot about how lucky that little Speaks tortoise was. Oh, lost interest. Phew. That must be one 
very grateful tortoise, if somewhat upended. I think she left it on its back. Not hungry or desperate enough just yet to go to the effort of attempting to prize that tortoise from its shell. Goes to show what an incredible evolutionary structure a tortoise shell really is. Amber eyes again munching on grass. I've just done a quick check of quarantine since that is where they we're going and I don't see much up there in terms of general game just one very musty elephant Brent's elephant ball that he started the morning with he looks as though he's slowly heading in our direction which could also be an interesting sighting an elephant in must could well decide to chase these lionesses Watching them walk through the bushes and I'm just trying to decide where I want to reposition or if I want to let them decide where they're going to go. Tammy, watching our show, would like to know, since they're not walking through on the road, would we be able to spot their tracks? Tammy, I'm going to shift forward a little bit while I answer your question. Tammy, yes, we would. Maybe it would be easier for Renius, the great tracker Renius, to see their or to view their tracks on this kind of ground. It's damp soil, which is really very tricky. I'm just going to let Amber come to us. She's going to slowly make her way towards us. In the meantime, the two ladies in front enjoying a bit of a bonding session. But Tammy, yes, we would be able to view their tracks. <laughs> it's a very solid grooming happening here. But it would have to be in places where the sand is nice and soft. That's how we track the animals once they go off the road. That's how we track them through the bushes. Sometimes having to guess a little bit along the way, particularly if you are tracking the Queen of Juma. Some adult on her way to join them. On this kind of or these kind of light conditions and with this wet soil that is compacted it does become a lot more tricky but tell me what i'll do is if i spot a, a lion track in the middle off the road i will stop and point it out to you and you can see if you can see it definitely harder to track in this light oh sweet While you were with Brent in that incredible goshawk sighting, the lionesses were actually playing together. So whilst they're hungry, they're not lacking in energy yet. <laughs> oh, adult female getting a little bit grumpy. She could be pregnant. Could be. I'm going to say that very tentatively. Difficult to tell at this stage, but her nipples are more prominent than the others. All stopping to eat grass again. And the sub-adult now looks... Oh, no, she's not going to. Now, I said that it's fairly tricky to determine whether or not a lion is pregnant until the later stages of the pregnancy and the reason behind one of the reasons behind that is an answer to Boti's question. Boti was wondering when do lions, what time of year do lions give birth and the answer to that is any time of year. So they can re reproduce throughout the year. Generally the members of the pride or members of the same pride will try and synchronize at least two of them will try and synchronize the births to within a few weeks of each other and that's because female li or lionesses, allosuckle, which they will feed each other's cubs. So they try and time it at the same time as a way of looking after each other's cubs and essentially increasing the success rate or the survival rate of their own cubs. So there's no set breeding time, 
but generally there's an attempt at synchronization between the different lionesses' estrus cycles and therefore the time at which they give birth. Now this is a very typical example of the hunting patterns and what we witnessed yesterday with James and the Nkuhumas. They've spread out quite considerably. We've got a female over there. We've got a female moving in the very dense vegetation just to the right of her. Not even, can you spot her? I yeah. see her. Okay. I think I see her. Oh, yeah, there she is, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there she is in the center of your screen now. There she's moving. Here's the second lioness. The third is the sub-adult off to the right. And Amber eyes even further away from the rest of the group. And I think what they're doing, and generally lionesses like to lie, as we saw this morning, they like to lie next to each other. First of all, they're trying to settle their stomachs with the grass, but second of all, they're maximizing the potential to get lucky. And what I mean by that is if an animal wanders into the sighting, an animal that would be on the menu for these lionesses, they've got a greater chance if they're spread out. I was absolutely staggered yesterday to watch the way in which they conducted the hunt that they did. With three of the lionesses remaining absolutely in the same place and allowing the female to take the lead and chase the wildebeest and zebra. But what astounded me was the way in which they had coordinated that. Now I would have expected the wildebeest and the zebra to run straight away from that female in the opposite direction of the pride. But somehow she managed, and it must have been deliberate, to redirect them to the rest of the pride. And although they weren't successful that day, to me that level of coordination and communication is incredible. Now I don't know how much of that is planned and communicated, how much of that is instinctive, and how much of it is to do with wind directions and making use of the contours of the land. But either way, you have to absolutely admire the skill of these hunters. And that is what makes lions so successful. As we see what these lions are going to decide to do, let's have a look at Brent and some pachyderms. So not the best visual, but we've got two young elephant bulls, uh, early 20s or so, uh, in uh, the broadleafed woodland next to us. I'm hoping they move into a slightly more becoming spot for, a, for, a, for an open shot. Let's try a little bit back. Hello, little men. Oh, there we go. Just slowly moving through the bush, feeding. So not quite at full size, not like that huge boy we had this morning. Now quite often you will find little groups, uh, and sometimes you've, I've seen up to 15 or 16 of these little bulls together. Here we've just got two, and just a little bit of company while they wait out uh, their time to get to the top. We can see, what's he feeding off there? Oh, yes, very big and scary. Uh, you'll see that behavior quite often with Ellie Bulls, old and young. A little head shake just to remind us that they're the big boss out here in the bush. But you can see from his tail wagging quite nicely there, uh, he's in no means stressed or upset with our presence. Now, an elephant's tail is one of the best indicators of an upset elephant when you see it start going rigid, you know, it's best to move along. And you can see it working to keep the flies away. 
Oh, what's making that noise? Ah, hello. We have a we have a visitor in the car. I just heard him scraping around. Not oh, yes, not very clever. Um, they still haven't mastered the art of landing yet. So it's fascinating when you see dung beetles um, around a, a, a dung. Whoa, pal. I'm going to let him go now because he, he's obviously got stuck in the wheel well. <laughs> Shame. Now, this is quite interesting. If you, if you, they've got this amazing flick reaction.